The first presidential debate was kind of a shit show. I covered that on my channel, but it seems that Trump has gotten the raw end of the deal from that one. The Kamala Harris versus Mike Pence debate went towards Mike Pence's side, though it didn't really make that much of a difference. I'll be here to fact check both presidential candidates again, as with the other two debates, so let's get right into it. The country is heading into a dangerous new phase. More than 40,000 Americans are in the hospital tonight with COVID, including record numbers here in Tennessee. And since the two of you last shared a stage, 16,000 Americans have died from COVID. So please be specific. How would you lead the country during this next stage of the coronavirus crisis? So, as you know, 2.2 million people modeled out were expected to die. Only if we did absolutely nothing. We closed up the greatest economy in the world. It was a great economy if you were rich. In order to fight this horrible disease that came from China. Deflecting responsibility. It's a worldwide pandemic. It's all over the world. You see the spikes in Europe and many other places right now. The spikes in Europe aren't nearly as bad as ours. In fact, I'm pretty sure that the spikes in Europe aren't even as bad as our normal days around here. Uh, if you notice, the mortality rate is down 85%. This stat is so noisy, it might as well not be useful. I mean, there's things like the average age of the person who gets infected and shit like that that make it basically not useful as any sort of statistic. Uh, the excess mortality rate is way down and much lower than almost any other country. And we're fighting it and we're fighting it hard. There is a spike. There was a spike in Florida and it's now gone. There was a very big spike in Texas. It's now gone. There was a very big spike in Arizona. It's now gone. And there are some spikes and surges in other places. They will soon be gone. Those spikes don't just go away. They infect more people people who could be super spreaders later on and turn into the next spike. We have a vaccine that's coming. It's ready. It's going to be announced within weeks and it's going to be delivered. We have uh, Operation Warp Speed, which is the military is going to distribute the vaccine. I can tell you from personal experience. Your personal experience means jack shit. I guess they would call it. Some people could say it was a cure. If it was really a cure, we'd be delivering it all over the world. If you, if you take a look at what we've done in terms of goggles and masks and gowns and everything else, and in particular ventilators, we're now making ventilators all over the world, thousands and thousands a month, distributing them all over the world. Many, many hospitals are still short on PPE. It will go away, and as I say, we're rounding the turn, we're rounding the corner. It's going away. Actually, COVID cases are on the rise, and so are deaths. Okay, former Vice President Biden, to you, how would you lead the country out of this crisis? 220,000 Americans dead. If you hear nothing else I say tonight, hear this. Anyone who's responsible for not taking control in fact, not saying I'm, I take no responsibility initially. Anyone who's responsible for that many deaths should not remain as president of the United States of America. We're in a situation where there are a thousand deaths a day now, a thousand deaths a day, and there are over 70,000 new cases per day. Compared to what's going on in Europe, as the New England Medical Journal said, they're starting from a very low rate we're starting from a very high rate. The expectation is we'll have another 200,000 Americans dead be time between now and the end of the year. If we just wore these masks, the president's own advisors have told him, we could save 100,000 lives. And we're in a circumstance where the president thus far and still has no plan, no comprehensive plan. What I would do is make sure we have everyone encouraged to wear a mask all the time. I would make sure we move in the direction of rapid testing, investing in rapid testing. I would make sure that we set up national standards as to how to open up schools and open up businesses so they can be safe and give them the wherewithal, the financial resources to be able to do that. We're in a situation now where the New England Medical Journal, one of the serious, most serious journals in the, in the whole world, said for the first time ever that this, the way this president has responded to this crisis has been absolutely tragic. And so, folks, I will take care of this. I will end this. I will make sure we have a plan.
You also said a vaccine will be coming within weeks. Yes. Is that a guarantee? Is, no, it's is, not a guarantee, but it will be by the end of the year. You just said it was not a guarantee, and then you immediately contradicted yourself. But I think it has a good chance. There are two companies, I think, within a matter of weeks, and it will be distributed very quickly. Can you tell us which companies? Uh, Johnson & Johnson is doing very well, Moderna is doing very well, Pfizer is doing very well, and we have numerous others. Johnson & Johnson actually paused their study because something went wrong with it. And we also have others that we're working on very closely with other countries, in particular Europe. Then why did we drop out of the global COVAX effort? Let me follow up with you, and because this is new information, you have said a vaccine is coming soon within weeks now. Your own officials say it could take well into 2021 at the earliest for enough Americans to get vaccinated. And even then, they say the country will be wearing masks and distancing into 2022. Is your timeline realistic? No, I think my timeline is going to be more accurate. I don't know that they're counting on the military the way I do, but we have our generals lined up, one in particular that's the head of logistics. And this is a very easy distribution for him. He's ready to go as soon as we have the vaccine. And we expect to have 100 million vials. As soon as we have the vaccine, he's ready to go. Damn, he really hates the experts, doesn't he? 40% of Americans say they would definitely agree to take a coronavirus vaccine if it was approved by the government. What steps would you take to give Americans confidence in a vaccine if it were approved? Make sure it's totally transparent. Have the scientists of the world see it, know it, look at it go through all the processes. And by the way, he's, this is the same fellow who told you this is going to end by Easter last time. This is the same fellow who told you that, don't worry, we're going to end this by the summer. We're about to go into a dark winter, a dark winter. And he has no clear plan, and there's no prospect that there's going to be a vaccine available for the majority of the American people before the middle of next year. President Trump, your reaction, he says you have no plan. I don't think we're going to have a dark winter and, at all. We're opening up our country. We've learned and studied and understand the disease, which we didn't at the beginning. When I closed and banned China from coming in heavily infected, and then ultimately Europe, but China was in January. Months later, he was saying I was xenophobic. I did it too soon. Now he's saying, oh, I should have, uh, I should have you know, moved quicker. But he didn't move quicker. He was months behind me. He also didn't have the best government information at his disposal like Many you had. Behind me. And frankly, he ran the H1N1 swine flu, and it was a total disaster, far less lethal, but it was a total disaster. Had that had this kind of numbers, 700,000 people would be dead right now. He's citing a Wall Street Journal opinion article for this statistic, not an academic study. It is study. a far less lethal disease. Uh, look, his own person who ran that for him, who, as you know, was his uh, chief of staff, said it was catastrophic, it was horrible, we didn't know what we were doing. The person you were citing was talking specifically about the vaccine effort for H1N1. Now he comes up and he tells us how to do this. Also, everything that he said about the way every single move that he said we should make, that's what we've done. We've done all of it. But he was way behind us. Vice President Biden, your response. My response is he is xenophobic, but not because he shut down access from China. And he did it late after 40 countries had already done that. In addition to that, what he did, he made sure that we had 44 people that were in there in China trying to get to Wuhan to determine what exactly the source was. What did the president say in January? He said, no, he said, this is, he's being transparent. The president of China is being transparent. We owe him a debt of gratitude. We, to, we have to thank him. And, and then what happened was we started talking about using the Defense Act to make sure we go out and get whatever is needed out there to protect people. And again, I go back to this. He had nothing. He did virtually nothing. And then he gets out of the hospital and he talks about where this is. Oh, don't worry. It's all going to be over soon. Come on. There's not another serious scientist in the world who thinks it's going to be over soon. President Trump, your reaction? I say over soon. I say we're learning to live with it. We have no choice. We can't lock ourselves up in a basement like Joe does. He has the, <laughs> he has the ability to lock himself up. I don't know. He's obviously made a lot of money someplace, but he has this thing about living in a basement. Well, you know how it is. The first person to make a personal attack is the one who loses, People right? People can't do that. By the way, I, as the president, couldn't do that. I'd love to put myself in the basement or in a beautiful room in the White House and go away for a year and a half until it disappears. I can't do that. And, Kirsten, every, t every meeting I had... Personal anecdotes and downplaying the virus. 99.9 .9 
of young people recover. 99% of people recover. Well, that depends on what you mean by recover. Less than 99% of people even survive, but of those who do, a lot of them have lingering symptoms. We have to recover. We can't close up our nation. We have to open our school, and we can't close up our nation, or you're not going to have a nation. He says that we're, uh, you know, we're learning to live with it. People are learning to die with it. Ooh. You folks home will have an empty chair at the kitchen table this morning. That man or wife going to bed tonight and reaching over to try to touch their, out of habit, where their wife or husband was, is gone. Learning to live with it. Come on. We're dying with it because he has never said, he said, you said it's dangerous. When's the last time? Is it really dangerous still? Are we dangerous? You tell the people it's dangerous now? What should they do about the danger? And you say, I take no responsibility. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I, take Very full, I take full responsibility. It's not my fault that it came here. It's China's fault. It's not taking responsibility. Also, it wasn't mostly China's fault. The virus just originated in China. Most of this pandemic is your fault. And you know what? It's not Joe's fault that it came here either. It's China's fault. They kept it from going into the rest of China for the most part, but they didn't keep it from coming out to the world, including Europe and ourselves. The fact is that when we knew it was coming, when it hit, what happened? What did the president say? He said, don't worry, it's gonna go away. Be gone by Easter, don't worry, the warm weather, don't worry, maybe inject bleach. He said he was kidding when he said that, but a lot of people thought it was serious. A whole range of things the president has said, even today, he thinks we are in control. We're about to lose 200,000 more people. When I closed, he said, I shouldn't have closed. And that went on for months. What Nancy Pelosi said the same thing. She was dancing on the streets in Chinatown in San Francisco. What? No. But when I closed, he said, this is a terrible thing, you xenophobic. I think he called me racist even. And because I was closing it to China. Now he says I should have closed it earlier. It just, Joe, it doesn't work. I didn't say either of those things. You certainly did. You early, certainly and I did. did. I okay. talked about a xenophobia in a different context. It wasn't about closing the border to Chinese coming to the United States. All right, I want to talk about both of your different strategies to handle. He thought this. I shouldn't have closed the border. Well, let's. That's obvious. Is that? Do you want to respond to that quickly, Vice President no. Biden? No. That's the best non-response ever. What do you say to Americans who are fearful that the cost of shutdowns, the impact on the economy, the higher rates of hunger, depression, domestic and substance abuse outweighs the risk of exposure to the virus? What I would say is I'm going to shut down the virus, not the country. It's his ineptitude that caused the, vi caused the country to have to shut down in large part. Why businesses have gone under, why schools are closed, why so many people have lost their living, and why they're concerned. Those other concerns, are that's why he should have been, instead of in a sand trap in his golf course, he should have been negotiating with Nancy Pelosi and the rest of the Democrats and Republicans about what to do about the acts they were passing for billions of dollars to make sure people had the capacity. But you haven't ruled out more shutdowns. Well, no, I, I'm not shutting down the name, but there are, look, they need standards. The standard is if you have a reproduction rate in a community that's above a certain level, everybody says, slow up, more social distancing, do not open bars and do not open gymnasiums, do not open until you get this under control, under more control. But when you do open, give the people the capacity to be able to open and have the capacity to do it safely. For example, schools. Schools, they need a lot of money to open. They need to deal with ventilation systems. They need to deal with smaller classes, more teachers, more pods. And he's refused to support that money, or at least up to now. Look, all he does is talk about shutdowns, but forget about him. His Democrat governors, Cuomo in New York, you look at what's going on in California, you look at Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Democrats, Democrats all, they're shut down so tight and they're dying. They're dying. Are you suggesting that lockdowns make more people die? And he supports all these people. All he talks about is shutdowns. No, we're not going to shut down and we have to open our schools. And it's like, as an example, I have a young son. Nobody cares about Barron. You've demanded schools open in person and insist they can do it safely. But just yesterday, Boston became the latest city to move its public school system entirely online after a coronavirus spike. What is your message to parents who worry that sending their children to school will endanger not only their kids, but also their teachers and okay. families? I want to open the schools. Uh, the transmittal rate to the teachers is uh, very small. But I want to open the schools. We have to open our country. We're not going to have a country. You can't do this. We can't keep this country closed. This is a massive 
country with a massive economy. What? None of this answers anything. People are losing their jobs. They're committing suicide. There's depression, alcohol, drugs at a level that nobody's ever seen before. There's abuse, tremendous abuse. We have to open our country. You know, I've said it often. The cure cannot be worse than the problem itself. Vice and that's what's happening. And he wants to close down. He'll close down the country if one person in our in our massive bureaucracy says we should close it down. Yeah, you just don't care that people die. It's pretty obvious. Vice President Biden, your Simply response. not true. We ought to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We ought to be able to safely open. But would they need resources to open? You need to be able to, for example, if you're going to open a business, have social distancing within the business. You need to have, if you have a restaurant, you need to have plexiglass dividers so people cannot infect one another. You need to be in a position where you can take testing rapidly and know whether a person is, in fact, infected. You need to be able to trace. You need to be able to provide the, all the resources that are needed to do this. And that is not inconsistent with saying that what we're going to make sure that we can open safely. And by the way, all you teachers out there, not that many of you are going to die, so don't worry about it. So don't worry about it. Come on. If you go and look at what's happened to New York, it's a ghost town. It's a ghost town. And when you talk about plexiglass, these are restaurants that are dying. These are businesses with no money. Because Putting up plexiglass is unbelievably expensive, and it's not the answer. I mean, you're going to sit there in a cubicle wrapped around with plastic. It's... These are businesses that are dying, Joe. You can't do that to people. You Which just you can. can't. Take a look at New York and what's happened to my wonderful city for, for so many years. I loved it. It was vibrant. It's dying. Everyone's leaving New York. Take a look Vice at President what New Biden. York has done in terms of the, turning the curve down in terms of the number of people dying. And I don't look at this in terms of the way he does. Blue states and red states. They're all the United States. And look at the states that are having such a spike in the coronavirus. They're the red states. They're the states in the Midwest. They're the states in the upper Midwest. That's where the spike is occurring significantly. Eh, a few blue states are also affected still. But they're all Americans. They're all Americans. And what we have to do is say, wear these masks, number one. Make sure we get the help that the businesses need that has money's already been passed to do that. It's been out there since the beginning of the summer, and nothing's happened. President, New York has lost more than 40,000 people, 11,000 people in nursing homes. President Trump, what when about... When you say spike, take a look at what's happening in Pennsylvania, where they've had it closed. Take a look at what's happening with your friend in Michigan, where her husband's the only one allowed to do anything. It's been like a prison. Now it was just ruled unconstitutional. Take a look at North Carolina. They're having spikes, and they've been closed and they're getting killed financially. We can't let that happen, Joe. You can't let that happen. We have to open up, and we understand the disease. We have to protect our seniors. We have to protect our elderly. We have to protect especially our seniors with heart problems and diabetes problems, and we will protect them. We have the best testing in the world by far. That's why we have so many cases. Let me no, we have more cases because we have more cases, not because we have more testing to detect them. This week, you called Dr. Anthony Fauci, the nation's best-known infectious disease expert, quote, a disaster. You described him and other medical experts as, quote, idiots. If you're not listening to them, who are you listening to let, as you let fight me, this? I'm listening to all of them, including Anthony. I get along very well with Anthony, but... He did say, don't wear masks. Unlike you, who have never undermined the legitimacy of mask wearing. No, seriously, though, Dr. Fauci changed his tune months ago, and you are still in the mask denialism phase. He did say, as you know, this is not going to be a problem. Uh, I think he's a Democrat, but that's okay. He said, this is not going to be a problem. We are not going to have a problem at all. When Joe says that I said... Anthony Fauci said, and others, and many others, and I'm not knocking him a lot. Nobody knew. Look, nobody knew what this thing was. Nobody knew where it was coming from, what it was. We've learned a lot. But Anthony said, don't wear masks. Now he wants to wear masks. Anthony also said, if you look back, exact words. Here's his exact words. This is no problem. This is going to go away soon. So he's allowed to make mistakes. He happens to be a good person. What was the point of that entire rant? Think about what the president knew in January and didn't tell the American people. He was told this was a serious virus that spread in the air, and it was much worse than, much worse than the flu. He went on record and said to one of your colleagues, recorded, 
that, in fact, he knew how dangerous it was, but he didn't want to tell us. He didn't want to tell us because he didn't want us to panic. He didn't want us — Americans don't panic. He panicked. But guess what? In the meantime, we find out in the New York Times the other day that, in fact, his folks went to Wall Street and said this is a really dangerous thing, and a memo out of that meeting, not from his administration, but from some of the brokers, said, sell short, because we've got to get moving. You're the one that takes all the money from Wall Street. I don't take it. Jay, I have. You, you have raised a lot of money, tremendous amounts of money. And every time you raise money, deals are made, Joe. I could raise so much more money. Trump's cabinet is full of Wall Street executives, and he takes hundreds of million dollars from foreign officials. Average We're contribution, $43. Biden won this segment. The amount of switching back and forth from different positions on the part of Trump is just amazing. And Biden, when he said, We're learning to die with it, that was, that was really good. While Biden was actually talking about his plans and what he was going to do, Trump was just saying, oh, that's insane, you can't do this, and he was just talking in really vague, general terms. He also made it really clear that he doesn't care about Americans, especially if they're poor or in a blue state. And of course, he still refuses to take responsibility for the virus and he keeps trying to downplay it, which works on nobody. All right, we're going to move on to our next section, which is national security. Russia and Iran are working to influence this election. Both countries have obtained U.S. voter registration information, these officials say, and Iran sent intimidating messages to Florida voters. What would you do to put an end to this threat? I made it clear, and I ask everyone else to take the pledge. I made it clear that any country, no matter who it is, that interferes in American elections will pay a price. They will pay a price. And it's been overwhelmingly clear this election, I won't even get into the last one, this election, that Russia has been involved, China has been involved to some degree, and now we learn that, that, uh, that uh, Iran is involved. They will pay a price if I'm elected. They're interfering with American sovereignty. That's what's going on right now. They're interfering with American sovereignty. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think the president said anything to Putin about it. I don't think he's stalking them a lot. I don't think he said a word. I don't know why he hadn't said a word to Putin about it. And I don't know what he has recently said, if anything, to the Iranians. My guess is he'd probably be more outspoken with regard to the Iranians. But the point is this, folks. We are in a situation where we have foreign company, countries trying to interfere in the outcome of our election. His own, own national security advisor told him that what is happening with his buddy — well, I won't — I shouldn't — well, I will. His buddy, Rudy Giuliani, he's being used as a Russian pawn. He's being fed information that is Russian — that is not true. And then what happens? Nothing happens. And then you find out that everything that's going on here about Russia is wanting to make sure that I do not get elected the next president of the United States because they know I know them and they know me. I don't understand why this president is unwilling to take on Putin when he's actually paying bounties to kill American soldiers in Afghanistan, when he's engaged in activities that are trying to destabilize all of NATO. I don't know why he doesn't do it, but it's worth asking the question, why isn't that being done? Any country that interferes with us will, in fact, pay a price because they're affecting our sovereignty. Joe got three and a half million dollars from Russia. And it came through Putin because he was very friendly with the former mayor of Moscow, and it was the mayor of Moscow's wife. And you got three and a half million dollars. Your family got three and a half million dollars. And this is very misleading. First of all, if any of the Bidens were involved in this, it would be Hunter Biden as usual. But there's not even clear evidence that Hunter Biden received the money. You know, someday you're going to have to explain why did you get three and a half. I never got any money from Russia. I don't get money from Russia. They both want you to lose because there has been nobody tougher to Russia with between the sanctions. Nobody tougher than me on Russia between the sanctions, between all of what I've done with NATO. You know, I've got the NATO countries to put up an extra 130 billion going to 420 billion dollars a year. That's to guard against Russia. I sold, while he was selling pillows and sheets, I sold tank busters to Ukraine. Your administration passed that, but you initially resisted. There has been nobody tougher than, on Russia than Donald Trump. Syria. And More conspiracy theories about Joe Biden and his family. I have not taken a penny from any foreign source ever in my life. We learned that this president paid 50 times the tax in China, has a secret bank account with China, does business in China, 
and in fact is talking about me taking money. I have not taken a single penny from any country whatsoever, ever, number one. Number two, this is a president. I have released all of my tax returns, 22 years. Go look at them, 22 years of my tax return. You have not released a single solitary year of your tax return. What are you hiding? Why are you unwilling? The foreign countries are paying you a lot. Russia's paying you a lot. China's paying you a lot. And your hotels and all your businesses all around the country, all around the world. And China's building a new road to a new ga a, a, a golf course you have overseas. So what's going on here? Why don't release your tax return or stop talking about corruption? I called my accountants under audit. I'm going to release them as soon as we can. I want to do it. You can. The IRS has said multiple times that you can release your tax returns even today, except you're not doing this because, well, it's before the election and you know you're corrupt. And it'll show how successful, how great this company is. But much more importantly than that, people were saying $750. I asked them a week ago, I said, what did I pay? They said, sir, you prepaid tens of millions of dollars. I prepaid my tax. Lies. In 2016 to 17, he paid 5 million total in taxes, except all those liabilities were somehow washed away and replaced with the $750 we know now. That $5 million, those are going to cover taxes that he will have to pay in the future, meaning he got away with paying less taxes. More conspiracy theories. Did he tell you when you can release them? Do you as have a the deadline for when you're going to release them? I get American treated people? worse than the Tea Party got treated. Trump being a snowflake about the fact that people are actually enforcing the laws. Why did he, he's been saying this for four years? Show us. Just show us. Stop playing around. You've been saying for four Everybody years knows. you're going to release your taxes. Nobody knows it, Mr. President. What they do okay. know is you're not paying your taxes or your paying taxes that are so low. When last time he said what he paid, he said, I only pay that little because I'm smart. I know how to game the system. Come on. Come on, folks. I was put through a phony witch hunt for three years. It started before I even got elected. They spied on my campaign. No president should ever have to go through what I went through. Let me just say this. Mueller, and 18 angry Democrats and FBI agents all over the place spent $48 million. They went through everything I had, including my tax returns, and they found absolutely no collusion and nothing wrong. More conspiracies. In retrospect, was anything about those relationships inappropriate or unethical? Nothing was unethical. Here's what the deal. Eh, Hunter Biden was pretty shady. It's just you weren't connected to it. We had this whole question about whether or not, because he was on the board, I later learned of a Burisma, a company, that somehow I had done something wrong. Yet every single solitary person when he was going through his impeachment testifying under oath who worked for him, said, I did my job impeccably. I carried out U.S. policy. Not one single solitary thing was out of line. Not a single thing, number one. Number two, the guy who got in trouble in Ukraine was this guy trying to bribe the Ukrainian government to say something negative about me, which they would not do and did not do because it never, ever, ever happened. My son has not made money in terms of this thing about, uh, what are you talking about, China. I have not had, a, the only guy made money from China is this guy. He's the only one. Nobody else has made money from China. His son didn't have a job for a long time, was sadly no longer in the military service. I won't get into that. And he didn't have a job. As soon as he became vice president, Burisma, not the best, look, not the best reputation in the world. I hear they paid him 183000 a month. Listen to this. 183 and they gave him a $3 million upfront payment. All right. 
And he had no I, energy I'm gonna let them No exactly. basis for that. Everybody investigated that. No one said anything he did was wrong in Ukraine. Yeah, I think it's pretty hard to argue that Hunter Biden's position wasn't a result of your vice presidency. It's just that you weren't involved directly with that. You've never divested from your business. You've personally promoted your properties abroad. A report this week, which was referenced, does indicate that your company has a bank account in China. So how can voters know that you don't have any foreign conflicts of interest? I have many bank accounts, and they're all listed, and they're all over the place. I mean, I was a businessman doing business. The bank account you're referring to, which is everybody knows about it, it's listed. The bank account was in 2013. That's what it was. It was opened and do it was closed in 2015, I believe. Trump tells a long story about how he decided to close his Chinese bank account. Only problem is it's still open. There have, of course, President Trump has said that they should pay for not being fully transparent in regards to the coronavirus. If you were president, would you make China pay? And please be specific, what would that look like? What I'd make China do is play by the international rules, not like he has done. He has caused the deficit of China to go up, not down. No, the trade deficit with China has slightly decreased, but our trade deficit in total has increased by a lot. With China, up, not down. We are making sure that in order to do business in China, you have to give all your intellectual property. You have to get a, have a partner in China. It's 51 percent. We would not do that at all, number one. Number two, we're in a situation where China would have to play by the rules internationally as well. When I met with Xi, that, and uh, when I was still vice president, he said, we're setting up air identification zones in the, in the South China Sea. You can't fly through them. I said, we're going to fly through them. We just flew B-52, B-1 bombers through it. We're not going to pay attention. They have to play by the rules. And what's he do? He embraces guys like the thugs like in North Korea and, and, uh, and the Chinese president and Putin and others. And he pokes his finger in the eye of all of our friends, all of our allies. We make up only, we were 25 percent, 25 percent of the world's economy. We need to be having the rest of our friends with us saying to China, these are the rules. You play by them or you're going to pay the price for not paying by them economically. That's the way I will run it. And that's what we did in upholding steel tariffs and a range of other things when we were president and vice president. And then we're going to move on to North Korea. Use your mute button, bitch. What specifically are you going to do to make China pay? You've said you're going First to make all, them pay. First of all, China is paying. They're paying billions and billions of dollars. I just gave $28 new billion. Dollars new sanctions? I just gave $28 billion to our farmers. Taxpayers' China, money. It's what? Taxpayers' money. Didn't no, come no, from yeah, China. you know the taxpayers. It's called China. You had to pay farmers billions because our trade war with China has been this disastrous. And the idea that most of that money is coming from China? No, most of it's coming out of the pockets of American taxpayers. China paid $28 billion, and you know what they did to pay it, Joe? They devalued their currency, and they also paid up. And you know who got the money? Our farmers, our great farmers, because they were targeted. You never charged them anything. Also, I charged them 25% on dumped steel because they were killing our steel industry. We were not going to have a steel industry. Okay. And now we have a steel okay. industry. Steel jobs have not come back. Also, our trade war with China has been disastrous for both countries. Prices have been rising and we haven't got enough revenue in return. There's a reason why he's bringing up all this malarkey. There's a reason for it. He doesn't want to talk about the, the, the substantive issues. It's not about his family and my family. It's about your family. And your family's hurting badly. If you're making less than, if you're a middle class family, you're getting hurt badly right now. You're sitting at the kitchen table this morning deciding, well, we can't get new tires, they're bald because we have to wait another month or so. Or are we going to be able to pay the mortgage? Or who's going to tell her she can't go back to, to community college? They're the decisions you're making in the middle class families like I grew up in Scranton and Claymont. They're in trouble. We should be talking about your families, but that's the last thing he wants to talk about. Well done, but you could have said it earlier. Typical political statement. Let's get off this China thing, and then he looks. The family, around the table, everything. Just right. a typical politician when I see that. Let's talk I'm about North Korea. I'm not a typical Korea politician. Okay, that's President why I got elected. That let's was, talk let's about get off the subject of China. Let's talk around, sitting around the table. All right. Come on, Joe, you can do better. Basically, all the policies you've passed are right in line with the Republican agenda. 
your establishment as fuck. I'm going to talk about North Korea now. President Trump, you've met with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un three times. You've talked about your beautiful letters with him. You've touted the fact that there hasn't been a war or a long-range missile test. And yet North Korea recently rolled out its biggest ever intercontinental ballistic missile and continues to develop its nuclear arsenal. Do you see that as a betrayal of the relationship you no. forged? So when I met with Barack... <laughs> He said, the biggest problem we have with North is North Korea. He indicated we will be in a war with North Korea. Guess what? It would be a nuclear war. And he does have plenty of nuclear capability. In the meantime, I have a very good relationship with him. Different kind of a guy, but he probably thinks the same thing about me. We have a different kind of a relationship. We have a very good relationship, and there's no war. And, you know, about oh, two months ago, he broke into a certain area. They said, oh, there's going to be trouble. I said, no, they're not, because he's not going to do that. And I was right. What the fuck are you saying? Look, instead of being in a war where millions of people, Seoul, you know, is 25 miles away, millions and millions, 32 million people in Seoul, millions of people would be okay. dead right now. President we Trump, don't have that's a war, 30 and seconds. I have a good Thank relationship. you. Vice President Biden, to you, North Korea conducted four nuclear tests under the Obama administration. Why do you think you would be able to rein in this persistent threat? Right because now? I'd make it clear, which we were making clear to China, they had to be part of the deal because here's the root. I made it clear and as a spokesperson of the administration when I went to China that they said, why are you moving your missile defense up so close? Why are you moving more forces here? Why are you continuing to do military maneuvers? with South Korea. I said, because North Korea is a problem and we're going to continue to do it so we can control them. We're going to make sure we can control them and make sure they cannot hurt us. And so if you want to do something about it, step up and help. If not, it's going to continue. What has he done? He's legitimized North Korea. He's talked about his good buddy, who's a thug, a thug, and he talks about how we're better off. And they are, have much more capable missiles, able to reach U.S. territory much more easily than ever did before. Are there any conditions under which you would meet with him? On the condition that he would agree that he would be drawing down his nuclear capacity to get that the Korean Peninsula should be nuclear free zone. Good answer. The meetings between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un are a good first step, but we didn't really get anything out of it. They tried to meet with him. He I wouldn't didn't. do it. He didn't like Obama. He didn't like him. He wouldn't do it. Okay, you yeah, have a mute button. He wouldn't do on. it. You and that's I... okay. You know what, North Korea? We're not in a war. We have a good relationship. You know, people don't understand. Having a good relationship Trump, with leaders of on, other countries is a, a good country. thing. We have that's what we had a good relationship with Hitler before he, in fact, invaded Europe, the rest of Europe. Come on. The reason he would not meet with President Obama is because President Obama said, we're going to talk about denuclearization. We're not going to legitimize you. and We're going to continue to put stronger and stronger sanctions on you. That's why he wouldn't meet with us. All right. And it didn't we happen. gave you a mute button for a reason. A Use President it. Okay, we they do need to left move on. me a mess. North Korea was a mess. We and in fact, if you remember so the first two or three months, tonight, there was a very Trump. dangerous period in my first three months before we sort of worked things out a little bit. Okay. There was a very day. They left us a mess. And Obama would be, I think, the first to say it was the single biggest problem he thought that our country. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this section. Both politicians accuse the other of being corrupt. And while both politicians are indeed corrupt, Biden's accusations tend to be more accurate than Trump's. But that doesn't really matter, does it? The accusations all just blend together and it's impossible for the average uninformed viewer to actually know who's telling the truth and who's not. Now, given that moderates tend to side for Biden rather than Trump, all Trump really needed to do was muddy up the waters and make it unclear who was the better candidate. And if people just decide, oh, both politicians are corrupt, I'm just not going to vote, then Trump, in effect, wins. The Republicans always win when people don't vote. So because of that technicality, I declare Trump the winner of this section. Okay, let's move on to American families and the economy. Over 20 million Americans get their health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. If the Supreme Court does overturn that law, those 20 million Americans could lose their health insurance almost overnight. So what would you do if those people have their health insurance taken away? First of all, I've already done something that nobody thought was possible. Through the legislature, I terminated the individual mandate. That is the worst part of Obamacare, as we call it. 
the individual mandate where you have to pay a fortune for the privilege of not having to pay for bad health insurance. I terminated. It. It's gone. So you took away a potential source of funding for the Affordable Care Act, but how does that answer the question? Now it's in court because Obamacare is no good. But then I made a decision. Run it as well as you can to my people, great people. Run it as well as you can. I could have gone the other route and made everybody very unhappy. They ran it. Uh, premiums are down. Everything's down. Under your administration, health care costs have consistently gone up. Here's the problem. No matter how well you run it, it's no good. Have you ever explained why it's no good besides the fact that Obama did it? Well, I know why you don't want it, because the health insurance companies don't want it. What we'd like to do is terminate it. We have the individual mandate done. I don't know that it's going to work. If we don't win, we will have to run it and we'll have Obamacare, but it'll be better run. But it no longer is Obamacare because without the individual mandate, it's much different. Pre-existing conditions will always stay. What I would like to do is a much better health care, much better. Details? Will always protect people with pre-existing. Early in your presidency, you proposed a health care plan and it did not cover pre-existing conditions. So I'd like to terminate Obamacare, come up with a brand new beautiful health care. The Democrats will do it because there'll be tremendous pressure on them and we might even have the House by that time. And I think we're going to win the House, okay? We'll see, but I think we're going to win the House. But come up with a better health care, always protecting people with pre-existing conditions. And one thing very important, we have 180 million people out there that have great private health care, far more than we're talking about with Obamacare. Joe Biden is going to terminate all of those policies. Why do you got to lie like that? We all know it's not true. These are people that love their health care. I haven't met a single person in my life who is happy with their health care plan. People that have been successful, middle income people, been successful. They have 180 million plans, 180 million people, families. Under what he wants to do, which will basically be socialized medicine, he won't even have a choice, they want to terminate 180 million plans. We have done an incredible job on health care, and we're going to do even better. What is your plan if the law is ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court? You have two minutes uninterrupted. What I'm going to do is pass Obamacare with a public option. It will become Biden care. The public option is an option that says that if you, in fact, do not have the wherewithal to be, if you qualify for Medicaid and you do not have the wherewithal in your state to get Medicaid, you automatically are enrolled, providing competition for insurance companies. That's what's going to happen. Secondly, we're going to make sure we reduce the premiums and reduce drug prices by making sure that there's competition that doesn't exist now by allowing the Medicare to negotiate drug prices with the insurance companies. Thirdly, the idea that I want to eliminate private insurance, the reason why I had such a fight for with 20 candidates for the nomination was I support private insurance. Why? Medicare for all would be objectively cheaper for the country. That's why I didn't, not one single person with private insurance would lose their insurance under my plan, nor did they under Obamacare. Actually, millions did lose health insurance because those plans didn't meet the minimum requirements. They did not lose their insurance unless they chose they wanted to go to something else. Lastly, we're going to make sure we're in a situation that we actually protect pre-existing. There's no way he can protect pre-existing conditions. None. Zero. You can't do it in the ether. He's been talking about this for a long time. There is no, he's never come up with a plan. I guess we're going to get the pre-existing condition plan the same time we get the infrastructure plan that we've been waiting for since 17, 18, 19, and 20. The fact is that there, he's already cost the American people because of his terrible handling of the COVID virus and the economic spillover. 10 million people have lost their private insurance. And he wants to take away 22 million more people who have it under Obamacare and over 110 million people with pre-existing conditions. And all the people from COVID are going to have pre-existing conditions. What are they going to do? I have a follow-up for you, Vice President sure. Biden. It relates to something that President Trump said. He's accusing you of wanting socialized medicine. What do you say to people who have concerns that your health care plan, which includes a government insurance option, takes the country one step closer to a health care system run entirely by the government? What's your I say it's ridiculous. It's like saying that, you know, we're uh, the idea that the fact that there's a public option that people can choose. That makes it a socialist plan. Look, the difference between the president, I think health care is not a privilege, it's a right. 
Everyone should have the right to have affordable health care. And I am very proud of my plan. It's gotten endorsed by all the major labor unions, as well as, as well as a whole range of other people who, in fact, are concerned in the medical field. This is something that's going to save people's lives, and this is going to give some people an opportunity, an opportunity to have health care for their children. How many of you home are worried and rolling around in bed tonight wondering what in God's name you're going to do if you get sick because you've lost your home insurance, your, your, your health insurance your company's gone under? We have to provide health insurance for people at an affordable rate, and that's what I do. Isn't this just funny? Trump is accusing Biden of doing something good like socialized medicine, and Biden's like, no, no, I'm not for good things. No, I'm seriously, I'm not. President Trump, Excuse me, he was there response. for 47 years. He didn't do it. <laughs> he was now there as vice president for eight years, and it's not like it was 25 years ago. It was three and three quarters. It was just a little while ago, right? Less than four years ago. He didn't do anything. He didn't do it. Americans have wanted more government involvement in health care since the 1920s at least. Even FDR wasn't able to get it done. He wants socialized medicine, and it's not that he wants it. His vice president, I mean, she is, is more liberal than Bernie Sanders and wants it even more. Joe Biden, the establishment moderate, nominating a person more liberal than Bernie Sanders? What? Bernie Sanders wants it. The Democrats won it. The establishment all voted for Biden, who is not for universal health care. You're going to have socialized medicine, just like you went with fracking. We're not going to have fracking. We're going to stop fracking. We're going to stop fracking. Then he goes to Pennsylvania after he gets a nomination, where he got very lucky to get it. And he goes to Pennsylvania, <laughs> and he says, oh, we're going to have fracking. People deserve to have affordable health care, period. Period, period, period. And the Biden care proposal will, in fact, provide for that affordable health care, lower premiums. What we're going to do is going to cost some money. It's going to cost over $750 billion over 10 years to do it. And they're going to have lower premiums. You can buy into the better plans, the cheaper plans, lower your premiums, deal with un 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 unexpected billing, and have your drug prices drop significantly. He keeps talking about it. He hasn't done a thing for anybody on health care. Not a thing. Tristan, when Very he quickly, says, then I want to talk when about he what's says public on option, Hill. he's talking about socialized medicine and, and, and health care. When he talks about a public option, he's talking about destroying your Medicare totally oh. destroyed, and destroying your Social Security. And this whole country will come down. You know, Bernie Sanders tried it Bernie. in his state. He tried it in a state. His governor was a very liberal governor. They want to make it work. Okay, it, let's hear, it was let's let Vice President Biden to work. respond. It doesn't Vice work. President. The reason it didn't work in Vermont was because costs of medicine itself were still sky high. You have to have the federal government be able to negotiate drug prices with the health insurance companies and with all the other companies that are involved with boosting up the prices to unreasonable levels. Then we can insure everybody. He's a very response. confused guy. He thinks he's running against somebody else. He's running against Joe Biden. I beat all those other people because I disagreed with them. No, you beat them because the American voters were scared to vote for somebody they actually liked. Your one and only purpose is to get Trump out of office. Joe Biden he's running against. And the idea that we're in a situation that they're going to destroy Medicare, this is the guy that the actuary at Medicare said, if in fact, at Social Security, if in fact he continues to withhold his plan to withhold the tax on Social Security, Social Security will be bankrupt bankrupt in by 2023. Trump isn't cutting payroll taxes. He's just removing them this year. With no way to make up for it. This is the guy who's tried to cut Medicare. So I don't, I mean, the idea that Donald Trump is lecturing me on Social Security and Medicare? Come on. He tried to get Ten rid seconds, of, he Mr. tried President, to hurt Social to Security to years question. ago, years ago. Go back and look at the records. He tried to hurt Social Security years ago. He said or the stock market will boom if I'm elected. If he's elected, the stock market will crash. Okay, let's move on to the next question. That. The idea that the stock market is booming is his only measure of what's happening. Where I come from in Scranton and Claymont, the people don't live off of the stock market. Just in the, uh, just in the last three, uh, three years during this crisis, so the, the billionaires in this country made, according to the Wall Street, 700 billion more dollars. 700 billion more dollars. Because that's his only measure. What happens to the ordinary people out there? 
What happens to them? Let's talk about what's happening on Capitol Hill. We're going to move on. 401ks are through the roof. We're going to move on. People's stock are through the roof. Only 32% of the American population has 401ks. And he doesn't come from Scranton. He was born and lived there for 10 years. As of tonight, more than 12 million people are out of work. And as of tonight, 8 million more Americans have fallen into poverty. And more families are going hungry every day. Those hit hardest are women and people of color. They see Washington fighting over a relief bill. Mr. President, why haven't you been able to get them the help they need? Because Nancy Pelosi doesn't want to approve it. I do. But you're the president. I do, but I still have to get. Unfortunately, that's one of the reasons I think we're going to take over the House because of her. Nancy Pelosi doesn't want to approve anything because she'd love to have some victories on a date called November 3rd. Nancy Pelosi does not want to approve it. We are ready, willing, and able to do something. Don't forget, we've already approved three plans, and it's gone through, including the Democrats, in all fairness. This one she doesn't want. It's near the election because she thinks it helps her politically. I think it hurts her politically. All right, Mr. Vice President, look. The Republican leader in 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 the United States Senate said he can't pass it. He will not be able to pass it. He does not have Republican votes. Why isn't he talking to his Republican friends? Let me follow up with you, Vice President if we made a Biden, deal, because the let me, let me ask Vice President Biden a question. You are the leader of the Democratic Party. Why have you not pushed the Democrats to get a deal for the American people? Well, I have, and they have pushed it. Look, they passed this act all the way back in the beginning of the summer. This is like it's not new. It's been out there. This HEROES Act has been sitting there. And look at what's happening. When I was in charge of the Recovery Act with $800 billion, I was able to get $145 billion to local communities that have to balance their budgets and states that have to balance their budgets, so they didn't have to fire fire they have to fire firefighters, teachers, first responders, law enforcement officers, so they could keep their cities and counties running. He will not support that. They have not done a thing for them. And Mitch McConnell said, let them go bankrupt. Let them go bankrupt. Come on. What's the matter the with this? The bill that guys? was passed in the House was a bailout of badly run, high crime, Democrat, all run by Democrats, cities and states. It was a way of getting a lot of money, billions and billions of dollars to these states. It was also a way of getting a lot of money from our people's pockets to people that come into our country illegally. Right. We are passing the bill specifically to help illegal immigrants. Also, you're racist. We were going to take care of everything for them. And what that does, and I'd love to do that, I'd love to help them, but what that does, everybody all over the world will start pouring into our country. We can't do it. This was a way of taking care of them. This was a way of spending on things that had nothing to do with COVID, as per your question. But it was really a big bailout for badly run Democrat cities and states. All right, I want to... If I get elected, I'm not going to... I'm running as a proud Democrat, but I'm going to be an American president. I don't see red states and blue states. What I see is American, United States. And folks, every single state out there finds themselves in trouble. They're going to start laying off, whether they're red or blue, cops, firefighters, first responders, because teachers, because they have to balance their budget. And the founders were smart. They allowed the federal government a deficit to spend to compensate for the United States of America. Damn. Trump just hanged himself and Joe Biden took advantage. I want to talk about the minimum wage, gentlemen. Mr. Yeah. Vice President, we are talking a lot about struggling small businesses yes. and business owners these days. Do you think this is the right time to ask them to raise the minimum wage? You, of course, support a $15 federal minimum I wage. I do, because I think one of the things we're going to have to do is we're going to have to bail them out, too. We should be bailing them out now, those small businesses. You got one in six of them going under. They're not going to be able to make it back. They passed a, pre- a, a package that allows us to be able to call PPP. Money is supposed to go to help them do everything from organize how they can deal with their businesses being open safely. D- d- schools, how they can make classrooms smaller, how they can hire more teachers, how they can put ventilation systems in. They need the help. The businesses as well as the schools need the help. But this, these guys will not help them is not giving them any of the money. We are going to move on to immigration, but I want to get your reaction. We have to help our small businesses by raising the minimum wage. That's not helping. Uh, I think it should be a state option. So that means you're going to do nothing. Alabama is different than New York. New York is different from Vermont. 
Every state is different. It should be a state you, option. You said very We have recently, to help. It's very important. We have to help our small businesses. You, you How said, are you helping your small businesses when you're forcing wages? What's going to happen and what's been proven to happen is when you do that, these small businesses fire many of their employees. Said, not true. Or in the words of Joe Biden, not recently true, Recently, you would consider the raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an it. hour. And I would consider it. In, to an extent, but in what I really like, what I re in a second administration, but not to a level that's going to put all these businesses out of business. It should be a state option. Look, Every... I've lived in different places. I know different places. They're all different. Some places, fifteen dollars is not so bad. In other places, other states, fifteen dollars. Okay, would be President ruinous. Trump. Thank no. you. Two jobs, one job, be below poverty. People are making six, seven, eight bucks an hour. These first responders, we all clap for as they come down the street because they've allowed us to make it. What's happening? They deserve a minimum wage of $15. Anything below that puts you below the poverty level. And there is no evidence that when you raise the minimum wage, businesses go out of business. That is simply not true. Yeah, Joe Biden won this segment pretty decisively. I mean, Trump's trying to tear down Obamacare when most of the American population wants Medicare for all. That's just a losing battle, and he provided no details as to how he would provide a better health care plan. Trump was unable to tout his pre-COVID economic numbers and his only one number that's good right now, the stock market, Joe Biden was able to dismantle fairly easily. Now, talking about the $15 minimum wage... I mean, Trump, you've got to be pretty stupid to oppose that, and you'll get punished for it. We're going to talk about immigration. Your administration separated children from their parents at the border, at least 4,000 kids. You've since reversed your zero-tolerance policy, but the United States can't locate the parents of more than 500 children. So how will these families ever be reunited? Uh, children are brought here by coyotes and lots of bad people. First of all, that's not true. Second of all, most immigrants actually commit less crimes than people who are just natural citizens. And third of all, you're racist. Cartels, and they're brought here, and they used to use them to get into our country. We now have as strong a border as we've ever had. We're over 400 miles of brand new wall. Of those 400 miles, most of it was just replacing pre-existing border fence. Also, the border is 2,000 miles long. You see the numbers, and we let people in, but they have to come in legally, and they come in through But America. how will you reunite let me these just tell kids you, with their families, let me just tell you, Mr. President? They built cages. You know, they used to say, I built the cages. And then they had a picture in a certain newspaper. And it was a picture of these horrible cages. And they said, look at these cages. President Trump built them. And then it was determined they were built in 2014. That was him. Do you they have a plan cages. to reunite the The detention facilities had chain link fences, but they were not cages. Kids yes, we're working families. on it very, we're, we're trying very hard. But a lot of these kids come out without the parents. They come over through cartels and through coyotes and through gangs. Trump, like, literally just doesn't care about the immigrant children. He just does not care. I mean, he's being pressed on this, and this should be a layup. It should be a softball, but instead, he just curves right back around to xenophobia. These 500-plus kids came with parents. They separated them at the border to make it a disincentive to come to begin with. Bay, real tough. We're really strong. And guess what? They cannot, it's not coyotes didn't bring them over. Their parents were with them. They got separated from their parents. And it makes us a laughing stock and violates every notion of who we are as a nation. Very powerful. Let me ask you a follow-up question. They did it. We changed the policy. Your response they to that? They did it. We, we changed. did not. They built the cages. The they, who, who built the cages, let's, Joe? Let's talk about what who we're talking about. Who built the cages, Let's Joe. talk about what we're talking about. What happened? Parents were ripped. Their kids were ripped from their arms and separated. And now they cannot find over 500 of sets of those parents, and those kids are alone. Nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. It's criminal. It's criminal. Let me ask Kristen, you about I will say this. They went down. We brought reporters, everything. They are so well taken care of. They're in facilities that were so clean. Oh, my God. That's so creepy. First of all, the facilities were not clean and comfy, as he suggests. 
They detained so many people that they just shoved everybody into these small facilities where there wasn't enough space. Hot meals were not served and everybody just slept on the floor. Disease and sickness ran rampant because everybody was just so cramped in. And even if the facilities were so great as he suggests, that still doesn't justify separating children from their parents. That's like some creepy dude offering candy to children in exchange for entering his windowless white van. Some of them have haven't been reunited good, But just ask families. one question. Who built the cages? I'd love you to ask him that. Who built the cages? Let me ask about your immigration policy, Mr. Vice President. The Obama administration did fail to deliver immigration reform, which had been a key promise during the administration. It also presided over record deportations as well as family detentions at the border before changing course. So why should voters trust you with an immigration overhaul now? Because we made a mistake. It, made too, it took too long to get it right. It took too long to get it right. I'll be president of the United States, not vice president of the United States. And the fact is, I've made it very clear. Within 100 days, I'm going to send to the United States Congress a pathway to citizenship for over 11 million undocumented people. And all of those so-called dreamers, those DACA kids, they're going to be immediately certified again to be able to stay in this country and put on a path to citizenship. The idea that they are being sent home by this guy and they want to do that is they go into a country they've never seen before. I can imagine you're five years old, your parents are taking you across the, the Rio Grande River and it's, and, it's, and it's illegal. And you say, oh no, mom, leave me here. I'm not going to go with you. They've been here. Many of them are model citizens. <laughs> um, technically, they're not citizens. Over 20,000 of them are first responders out there taking care of people during this crisis. Ooh. We owe them. We owe them. Kristen, he had reaction. eight years to do what he said he was going to do. And I've changed we did. without having a specific. We got rid of catch and release. That's bad, you know. I mean, they're not dangerous people. We got rid of a lot of horrible things that they put in and that they lived with. But he had eight years he was vice president. He did nothing except build cages to keep children in. Vice President Wrong. Biden, your response. The catch and release, you know what he's talking about there? If in fact you had a family came across and they were arrested, they in fact were given a date to show up for their hearing. They were released. And guess what? They showed up for a hearing. And this is the first president in the history of the United States of America that's anybody seeking asylum has to do it in another country. That's never happened before in America. That's never happened before in America. You come to the United States and you make your case that I seek asylum based on the following on the following premise, why I deserve it under American law. They're sitting in squalor on the other side of the river. It just shows that he has no understanding of immigration or the laws. Catch and release is a disaster. A murderer would come in, a rapist would come in, a very bad person would come in. Oh my god, you're so fucking racist. Immigrants, by and large, are less likely to commit crimes than people who were born here. We would take their name. We have to release them into our country. And then you say they come back. Less than 1% of the people come back. First of all, most people who are released do, in fact, come back. And of the people who don't, a lot of them don't because they can't pay for transportation or that sort of thing, or they simply forgot and need to be reminded. We have to send ICE out and Border Patrol out to find them. We would say, come back in two years, three years, we're going to give you a court case. You need Perry Mason. We're going to give you a court case. When you say they come back, they don't come back, Joe. Yeah. They never come back. Only the really, I hate to say this, but those with the lowest IQ. So fucking racist. He literally doesn't care that people are treated fairly under the law. He just doesn't care. As long as you're brown, he just does not care if you just get imprisoned for years at a time. They might come back. Okay, President very, Trump, let's give few. Vice President... Know the law, what he's telling you is simply not true. Well, check, check it, it out. out. They don't come back. Check it out. All right, let's move on to But we don't have to, to worry about section. it because they terminated it, so we don't have to worry about let's it Let's move right. on to the next section. you have 525 kids not knowing where in God's name they're going to be and lost their parents. Go ahead. All right, the talk. It happens regardless of class and income. Parents who feel they have no choice but to prepare their children for the chance that they could be targeted, including by the police, for no reason other than the color of their skin. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? I do. 
I do. You know, my daughter... This line of thought goes nowhere. One of the reasons why I ended up working on the east side of Wilmington, Delaware, which is 90% African-American, was to learn more about what was going on. What I didn't... I never had to tell my daughter, if she's pulled over, make sure she puts for a traffic stop, put both hands on top of the wheel and don't reach for the glove box because someone may shoot you. But a black parent, no matter how wealthy or how poor they are, has to teach their child. When you're walking down the street, don't have a hoodie on when you go across the street. Making sure that you, in fact, if you get pulled over, yes, yes, sir, no, sir, hands on top of the wheel, because you are, in fact, the victim, whether you're a person making 300000 child of a $300,000 a year person or someone who's on, on, on food stamps. The fact of the matter is, there is institutional racism in America. Yes, but the definitions are pretty dodgy and I kind of don't like them. Obviously, there's laws out there still that don't mention race specifically, but they are obviously designed with race in mind, and you can see that in the way that they're implemented. Other things like police tendencies to brutalize black people more often and those sorts of things, those are also statistically verifiable, but I don't know why we call that systemic racism. It's like, individual police officers doing it in large enough numbers that it shows up in the stats. And we have always said, we've never lived up to it, that we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal. But guess what? Fact check, we were evolved and not created at all. Also, we're not equal. Obviously, Donald Trump is inferior to you. We have never, ever lived up to it, but we've always constantly been moving the needle further and further to inclusion. Eh... I mean, the needle has moved back and forth for a while. I mean, after Reconstruction, they implemented Jim Crow and actually kind of undid a lot of the progress that we originally had and implemented segregation. Only after the civil rights laws were passed that that kind of got fixed, and now we have the drug war and other forms of discrimination. So, it's not constant progress in America, I'm afraid. Not exclusion. This is the first president to come along and says, that's the end of that. We're not going to do that anymore. We have to provide for economic opportunity, better education, better health care, better access to schooling, better access to opportunity to borrow money to start businesses. All the things we can do, and I've laid out a clear plan as to how to do those things just to give people a shot. It's about accumulating the ability to have wealth as well as it is to be free from violence. Do you understand why these parents fear for their children? Yes, I do. And again, he's been in government 47 years. He never did a thing, except in 1994, when he did such harm to the black community. And they were called, and he called them, super predators. That was crooked Hillary. And he said that. He said it, super predators. And they kept never lived that down. 1994, your crime bill, the super predators. Nobody has done more for the black community than Donald Trump. And if you look, with the exception of Abraham Lincoln, possibly exception, but the exception of Abraham Lincoln, nobody has done what I've done. Criminal justice reform, Obama and Joe didn't do it. I don't even think they tried because they had no chance at doing it. No, they tried, but their legislation took long enough that they actually passed it under your administration where you signed it instead and took credit for it. Some pointless tall tale. Criminal justice reform, prison reform, opportunity zones with Tim Scott, a great senator from South Carolina. He came in with this incredible idea for opportunity zones. It's one of the most successful programs. People don't talk about it. Tremendous investment is being made. Biggest beneficiary, the black and Hispanic communities. There is no evidence that opportunity zones have meaningfully benefited the black residents around them. And then historically black colleges and universities. Well, you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel on that one, aren't you? From the war on drugs, your attack on low-income housing requirements, your disastrous immigration policy, not to mention you stirring up racial divisions like nobody else. Your record on race is awful. A probably made-up personal anecdote. He never, ever said what he accused me of saying. The fact of the matter is, in 2000, though, after the crime bill had in the law for a while, this is a guy who said, the problem with the crime bill, there's not enough people in jail. There's not enough people in jail. 
and go on my website, get the quote, the date when he said it. Not enough people. He talked about marauding gangs, young gangs, and the people who are going to maraud our cities. This is a guy who, in the Central Park Five, five innocent black kids, he continued to push for making sure that they got the death penalty. None of them were, none of them were guilty of what the crime, of the crimes they were suggested. Granted, he did, in fact, let 20 people, he commuted 20 people's sentences. We commuted over 1,000 people's sentences, over 1,000. The very law he's talking about is a law that, in fact, initiated by Barack Obama. And secondly, we're in a situation here where we, the federal prison system was reduced by 38,000 people under our administration. And one of these things we should be doing, there should be no, no minimum ma mandatories in the law. That's why I'm offering $20 billion to states to change their state laws to eliminate minimum mandatories and set up drug courts. No one should be going to jail because they have a drug problem. They should be going to rehabilitation. Yes! Finally, not to jail. We should fundamentally change the system, and that's what I'm going to do. But why didn't he do it four years ago? And he's running so he can get more done. Why do you keep returning to this line? I ran because of you. And Joe's running because of you, so it all comes full circle, no? I hope he does look at me, because what's happening here is you know who I am. You know who he is. You know his character. You know my character. You know our reputations for honor and telling the truth. I am anxious to have this race. I am anxious to see this take place. I am, the character of the country is on the ballot. Our character is on the ballot. Look at us closely. And this we're gonna have stuff is true question. about Russia, Ukraine, China, other countries, Iraq. If this is true, it's not. then he's a corrupt politician. Right. So don't give me the stuff about how you're this innocent baby. Joe, they're calling you a corrupt politician. There are 50 former national intelligence folks who said that what this he's accusing me of is a Russian plant. They have said that this is, has all the care. Four, five former heads of the CIA, both parties, say what he's saying is a bunch of garbage. Nobody believes it except the, his and his good friend, Rudy Gianni. You mean the laptop is now yeah. another Russia, Russia, Russia hoax? And that's exactly be. what is this that's where you're exactly going? What this is told. where he's going. The that, laptop right. is Russia, yes. Russia, Gentlemen, Russia? I want to stay on the issue of race. You okay? have to be kidding. Here Mr. we go President? again with Russia. I don't even know what to say. I mean, one of them is peddling a conspiracy theory, and the other one is calling that conspiracy theory a part of another conspiracy. Ugh. You've described one. the Black Lives Matter movement as a symbol of hate. You've shared a video of a man chanting white power to millions of your supporters. You've said that black professional athletes exercising their First Amendment rights should be fired. And this guy is the one who stands for free speech and against cancel culture. What do you say to Americans who say that kind of language from a president is contributing to a climate of hate and racial strife? Well, you have to understand, the first time I ever heard of Black Lives Matter, they were chanting pigs in a blanket, talking about police. Pigs, pigs, talking about our police. Pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. I said, that's a horrible thing. And they were marching down the street. And that was my first uh, glimpse of Black Lives Matter. I thought it was a terrible thing. Come on, just say it. You hate Black Lives Matter. As far as uh, my relationships with all people, I think I have great relationships with all people. <laughs> Is he seriously all lives mattering right now? God. I am the least racist person in this room. <laughs> what do you say to Americans who are concerned by that? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say. I got criminal justice reform done, and prison reform, and opportunity zones, and took care of black colleges and universities. I don't know what to say. They can say anything. I mean, they can say anything. It's a very, it makes me sad because I am, I, I am the least racist person i can't even <laughs> see the audience because it's so dark but i don't care who's in the audience i'm the least racist person in this room let me remind you that this is the same guy who early in his career implemented discriminatory housing policies and actually has released ads basically dog whistling the jewish question he's literally a nazi abraham lincoln here is one of the most racist presidents we've had in modern history he pours fuel on every single racist fire. 
every single one. He started off his campaign coming down the escalator saying he's going to get rid of those Mexican rapists. He's banned Muslims because they're Muslims. He has moved around and made everything worse across the board. He says to the, about the poor boys, last time we were on stage here, he said, I told him to stand down and stand ready. <clears throat> um, technically, it's the proud boys, and he said stand back and stand by. Come on. This guy has a dog whistle about as big as a foghorn. Hey. Uh, he made a reference to Abraham Lincoln. Where did that come in? I mean, you said you're Abraham that, Lincoln. No, no, where did that? No, no. You said, I said not since Abraham Lincoln. What even is this? Crime bill, which put oh God. Th- tens of thousands of black men mostly in jail. All right, let me, you know let what? Me, let me they ask remember Vice it President because if you Biden look at what's happening with the voting right now, let me ask they Vice remember President that Biden you treated them very, very badly. The, Just the, take a look at what's happening out there. Crime okay. bills that you supported in the 80s and 90s contributed to the incarceration of tens of thousands of young black men who had small amounts of drugs in their possession. One of the things is that in the 80s, we passed 100%, all 100 senators voted for it, a bill on drugs and how to deal with drugs. It was a mistake. I've been trying to change the sense and particularly the portion on cocaine. That's why I've been arguing that, in fact, we should not send anyone to jail for a pure drug offense. They should be going into treatment across the board. That's what we should be spending money on. That's why I set up drug courts, which were never funded by our Republican friends. They should not be going to jail for a drug or an alcohol problem. They should be going into treatment. Treatment. That's what we've been trying to do. That's what I'm going to get done because I think maybe the American people have now seen that, in fact, it was a mistake to pass those laws relating to the drug. But they were not in the crime bill. But okay, why so. didn't he get it done? See, it's all talk, no action with these politicians. Oh, so annoying. 38,000 prisoners were released from federal prison. We have, there were over 1,000 people who were given clemency. We have made, in fact, we're the ones that put in the legislation saying we could look at pattern and practice of police departments and what they were doing, how they were conducting themselves. I could go on, but we began the process. We began the process. We lost an election. That's why I'm running to win back that election and change his terrible policy. Because you're all talk and no action. All right, Vice President because Biden, and then we're going to move on to the next section. We had a Republican Congress. There you go. That's the answer. Well, you okay. Gotta talk, you got to talk him into it, Joe. Fuck, he's so him. creepy. We're going to move on to our next yeah. section, Like I did with criminal change. justice reform. Okay. I had to talk Democrats into Gentlemen, it. Gentlemen, you did we're, we're running out of time. So Trump's main points here were... Criminal justice reform, which started under Obama. Historically, black colleges and opportunity zones, which don't even help that much. And these claims went largely uncontested, but they're still rather unimpressive. He did take some jabs at Biden's record, though I doubt that's going to stick. But most importantly, he just kept racist dog whistling all over the place. So what are you going to do? Climate change. President Trump, you say that environmental regulations have hurt jobs in the energy sector. Vice President Biden, you have said you see addressing climate change as an opportunity to create new jobs. How would you both combat climate change and support job growth at the same time? So uh, we have the Trillion Trees program. We have so many different programs. I do love the environment, but what I want is the cleanest, crystal clear water. Your administration has handed down deregulations for water that will actually pollute drinking water for millions of Americans. The cleanest air. You've also been rolling back vehicle emission standards and more. We have the best, lowest number in carbon emissions which is a big standard. Backhanded insult at Joe Biden. The best carbon emission numbers that we've had in 35 years. Most of that reduction in carbon emissions happened during the Obama years. Under this administration, we are working so well with industry, but here's what we can't do. Look at China, how filthy it is. Look at Russia, look at India, it's filthy. The, the air is filthy. That's a strange choice to compare us with, but we actually pollute more per capita anyway, so... The Paris Accord, I took us out because we were going to have to spend trillions of dollars. The Paris Climate Accords are non-binding. 
Also, we should be spending trillions of dollars. And we were treated very unfairly. When they put us in there, they did us a great disservice. They were going to take away our businesses. I will not sacrifice tens of millions of jobs. The fossil fuel industry only employs one million people. Thousands and thousands of companies because of the Paris Accord. So much whining, dude. Climate change, climate warming, the global warming is the next essential threat to humanity. We have a moral obligation to deal with it. And we're told by all the leading scientists in the world, we don't have much time. We're going to pass the point of no return within the next eight to 10 years. Four more years of this man eliminating all the regulations that were put in by us to clean up the climate, to clean up, to limit the, the uh, uh, limited emissions will put us in a position where we're going to be in real trouble. Here's where we have a great opportunity. I was able to get both all the environmental organizations as well as labor, the people worried about jobs, to support my climate plan. Because what it does, it will create millions of new good paying jobs. We're going to invest in, for example, 50,000 charging stations on our highways so that we can own the electric car market of the future. In the meantime, China is doing that. We're going to be in a position where we're going to see to it that we're going to take 4 million existing billion buildings and 2 million existing homes and retrofit them so they don't leak as much energy, saving hundreds of millions of barrels of oil in the process and creating significant number of jobs. And by the way, the whole idea of what this is all going to do, it's going to create millions of jobs and it's going to clean the environment. Our health and our jobs are at stake. That's what's happening. And what right now, by the way, Wall Street firms indicated that my plan, my, my plan will in fact create 18.6 million jobs, 7 million more than his. This is from Wall Street. And I'll create $1 trillion more in economic growth than his proposal does. Not on climate, just on the economy. President Trump, you're They came out and said very strongly, $6,500 will be taken away from families under his plan. How? Are we talking about taxes? Because that's certainly not going to happen. That his plan is an economic disaster. If you look at what he wants to do, you know, the, if you look at his plan, no, his environmental plan, you know who developed it? AOC plus three. <laughs> I wish AOC plus three support the Green New Deal, which Biden does not. They know nothing about the climate. I mean, she's got a good line of stuff, but she knows nothing about the climate. And they're all hopping through hoops for AOC plus three. Look, their real plan costs a hundred trillion dollars. He's talking about the Green New Deal here, which Biden doesn't even support. But let's just humor him for a second. The study that he's citing actually says $93 trillion, not 100 He just rounded up. But if you look at the methodology of that right-wing think tank study, it's really terrible. I mean, they talk about $36 trillion coming from universal health care, despite the fact that universal health care would actually save us money. And another 40-something trillion dollars of that comes from a federal jobs guarantee, and they just assume that all of that money would come directly out of the government budget. So if you remove all of that, what you're left with is a far more manageable number. If we had the best year in the history of our country for 100 years, we would not even come close to a number like that. When he says buildings, they want to take buildings down because they want to make bigger windows into smaller windows. He literally got this one straight out of Hannity. As far as they're concerned, if you had no window, it would be a lovely thing. This is the craziest plan that anybody has ever seen. All right, that's enough of your bullshit. I don't know where he comes from. I don't know where he comes up with these numbers. A hundred trillion dollars. Give me a break. This plan was, um, this is plan is endorsed by every major, every major environmental group and every labor group, labor, because they know the future lies. The future lies in us being able to breathe and they know their good jobs in getting us there. And by the way, the fastest growing industry in America, uh, solar energy and wind. He thinks wind causes cancer, windmills. He literally does think that. It's the fastest growing jobs and they pay good prevailing wages, 45, 50 bucks an hour. We can grow and we can be cleaner if we go the route I'm proposing. We are energy independent for the first time. Not quite. Close. 
We don't need all of these countries that we had to fight war over because we needed their energy. We are energy independent. I know more about wind than you do. Oh. It's extremely expensive, kills all the birds. <laughs> it's very intermittent. It's got a lot of problems. And they happen to make the windmills in both Germany and China. And the fumes coming up, if you're a believer in carbon emission, the fumes coming up to make, make these massive windmills is more than anything that we're talking about with natural gas, which is very clean. Is he just making shit up? Windmills don't pollute the air. They do kill birds, though. One other thing. Find me a scientist solar. To say that. I love solar, but solar doesn't quite have it yet. It's not powerful yet to to really run our big, beautiful factories that we need to compete with the world. So False. it's all a pipe dream. But you know what we'll do? We're going to have the greatest economy in the world. But if you want to kill the all economy, right. get rid of your oil industry. You want and, and what about fracking? I to have respond. never said I oppose fracking. Y you said it I, on tape. I did show the tape. Put it on your website. I'll put it on. Put it on the website. The fact of the matter is Shorty he's list. flat lying. Would you flat. rule out banning fracking? I do rule out banning fracking because the answer we need, we need buffering, other buffering industries to transition to get to ultimately a complete zero emissions by 2025. What I will do with fracking over time is make sure that we can capture the emissions from the fracking. I'm more worried about the weird chemicals spilling into our ground. Capture the emissions from gas. You mean gasoline or natural gas? Because natural gas is pretty clean. We can do that, and we can do that by investing money and doing it. But it's a transition to that. He, he was against fracking. Does he not understand that fracking is a bad thing? Fracking on federal land, I said. No fracking you and or fracking. oil on federal land. Let me ask people of color are much more likely to live near oil refineries and chemical plants. In Texas, there are families who worry the plants near them are making them sick. Your administration has rolled back regulations on these kinds of facilities. Why should these families give you another four years in office? Uh, the families that we're talking about are employed heavily and they're making a lot of money, more money than they've ever made. If you look at the kind of numbers that we produce for Hispanic, for Black, for Asian, it's nine times greater the percentage gain than it was under, in three years, than it was under eight years of the two of them, to put it nicely. This number comes from Census Bureau information filled back in March, when everybody was locked down and only the richest people were actually bothering to tell us about their financial situations. Nine times more. Now, somebody lives, I have not heard the numbers or the statistics that you're saying, but they're making a tremendous amount of money economically. We saved it. And I saved it again a number of months ago when oil was crashing because of the pandemic. Okay. We saved it. We got, say what you want about relationship, we got Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Russia to cut back way back. Cut back on what? We saved our oil industry. Yay, big oil. I'm glad you looked out for those little guys. And now it's very vibrant to get, right. and everybody has very inexpensive gasoline. Most people live on what they call fence lines. He doesn't understand this. They live near chemical plants that in fact pollute chemical plants and oil plants and refineries that pollute. I used to live near that when I was growing up in Claymont, Delaware and all the more oil refineries in Marcus Hook and the Delaware River than there is any place, including in Houston at the time. When my mom get in the car and when, when there were first frost to drive me to school, turn in the windshield, wiper, there'd be oil slick in the window. That's why so many people in my state were dying and getting cancer. The fact is those frontline communities, it doesn't matter what you're paying them, it matters how you keep them safe. What do you do? And you impose restrictions on the pollutions that it, the pollutants coming out of those fence line communities. Would you close down the oil industry? By the way, I would transition from the oil industry, yes. Oh, I would that's transition. a big statement. It you. is a big statement. That's a because big statement. I would stop. Why would you do that? Because the oil industry pollutes significantly. Oh, I see. And here's the deal. But that's you can't a big statement. That. Well, if you let me finish the statement, because it has to be replaced by renewable energy over time, over time. And I'd stop giving to the oil industry, I'd stop giving them federal subsidies. He won't give federal subsidies to the to the gas. Excuse me, to the to uh, solar and wind. Yeah. Why are we giving it to oil industry? Look at that punchable face. He looks like he scored a point here. We actually do All give right. it to solar and wind. We and that's maybe the biggest question. statement in terms of business. That's the biggest statement. Okay. Because basically, what he's saying question, is he is Mr. going President. to destroy 
the oil industry. Okay. Will you remember that, Texas? Will you okay. remember that, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma? Vice President it takes everything out of context, but the point is, look, we have to move toward a net zero emissions. The first place to do that by the year 2035 is in energy okay. production, by 2050 totally. All right. One is he going to get China to do it? No, we're finished with is this. Is he going we have to, to get move China on to, to our do our final it? question? No, we have to I'm move on to our final question. I'm going to rejoin Paris Accord and make oh. China abide by what they agreed to. All right. I think Biden won substantively, at least, but that all depends on whether the voters can detect that Trump basically lied every time he opened his mouth during this segment. I mean, there's not that much you can do when you can't really predict which lies that Trump's going to make up. He did expose himself by answering the last question by simply saying, yeah, I don't care if they die as long as they feed the economy. But I don't know. I think this is sort of a soft win for Biden. Imagine this is your inauguration day. What will you say in your address who America, to Americans who did not vote for you? You'll each have one minute, starting with you, Mr. We Biden. have to make a country totally successful as it was prior to the plague coming in from China. Yeah, back then everything was peachy keen. Now we're rebuilding it and we're doing record numbers, 11.4 million jobs in a short period of time, etc. You just regain some of the jobs that you lost. A lot of the job losses are actually permanent, though. But I will tell you, go back. Before the plague came in, just before, I was getting calls from people that were not normally people that would call me. They wanted to get together. We had the best black unemployment numbers in the history of our country. Thanks to Obama in large part. Hispanic. Obama. Women. Obama. Asian. Obama. People with diplomas, with no diplomas, MIT graduates, number one in the class, everybody had the best numbers. Obama. And you know what? The other side wanted to get together. They wanted to unify. Success is going to bring us together. You are polling worse than Biden before COVID. We are on the road to success, but I'm cutting taxes and he wants to raise everybody's taxes. That's not true. He's only raising taxes if your income is $400,000 or more. And he wants to put new regulations on everything. Is is that supposed to be a bad thing? He will kill it. If he gets in, you will have a depression the likes of which you've never seen. Your 401ks will go to hell, and it'll be a very, very sad day for this country. I'm an American president. I represent all of you, whether you voted for me or against me. And I'm going to make sure that you're represented. I'm going to give you hope. We're going to move. We're going to choose science over fiction. <sighs> We're going to choose hope over fear. We're going to choose to move forward because we have enormous opportunities, enormous opportunities to make things better. We can grow this economy. We can deal with the systemic racism. And at the same time, we can make sure that our economy is being run and moved and motivated by clean energy, creating millions of new jobs. And that's the fact. That's what we're going to do. And I'm going to say, as I said at the beginning, what is on the ballot here is the character of this country. Decency, honor, respect, treating people with dignity, making sure that everyone has an even chance. And I'm going to make sure you get that. You haven't been getting it the last four years. All right, I'm pretty sure Joe Biden handily won this debate. Joe Biden was pretty clear on all his policy positions, so he wasn't about to let Trump misrepresent him again. And Trump, well, he lied so often that I think anybody who didn't know already pretty much caught on. He also displayed himself as really racist and someone who doesn't care about the American people. So there's that to contend with as well. Of the few people that haven't decided yet... I'm pretty sure most of them are going to lean Biden, but basically, I don't think this debate will make too much of a difference because most people are already decided. We'll see how that plays out in the polls, though. I'm and I approve this message.